have with us uh, Professor Yang Zhao. And so, uh, Professor Zhao, this is her end of the first, or middle of the first year, so she started in January of 2019. Um, so her research is in nanophotonics, and she also does atomic force microscopy. And so we have her talking about communications, again, completely unrelated to her field. So <laughs> please, uh, please welcome her. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that opportunity and welcome to the 16th 365 camp and again my name is Yang Zhao um, I know it's difficult to remember the name uh, so if you forgot about it just remember um, my initial Z okay so um, I will want to spend the first half minute to talk a little bit about my research and uh, you know I'm going to talk about communications but communications is about all about how you transmit signals how you preserve signals how you actually filter out certain uh, signals those are all important for all aspects of the research uh, i'm doing and my main research focus on nanophotonics so you can like uh, separate this word into nano means nanostructure nanotechnology and photonics means something related to photon or light so what i combine is i design nanostructures and use them to manipulate behaviors of light and with that we can actually create uh, new tools and functionalities. For example, I work on optical force microscopy which combine light and optical forces with atomic force microscope and tomorrow at the lab tour you will have an opportunity to, to see part of this part of the research. And we can shine light or pulse light into cells and then we can use uh, the atomic force microscope to listen to the forces and eventually we can map out our image what's going on inside or on top of the cells and how about these uh, molecular interactions we can resolve and we can also uh, make sensors and the two types of sensors I'm most interested in one is variable sensors we can design these nanostructures and then we can use them as a variable device we can attach to our skin and use that to detect certain molecular markers then for us uh, for example molecular markers that's related to early disease uh, diagnosis. And also we can make these sensors like a standalone uh, diagnostic tools. So what we can do is we can collect, uh, we can use them um, to like filter out uh, drugs. We can use them as a drug purification and again um, capitalize on the sensitivity and a light induced force uh, given that. So that's enough about my research and today our focus is communications. And the first I want to talk about um, the voice communication, how we transmit voice signals. So I'm talking here, I'm generating a lot of voice signals and your ear actually is collecting it, these signals. Um, so here I show um, anatomical figures of our ear. So I'm no biologist, but here is something very interesting about how these signals are transmitted through our ears. You have the outer side called pina of the ear and then that collects the sound signals and transmit it through this outer range of the ears. And there is a membrane called tympanic membrane, it's our eardrum, so that amplify these signals in air. And after the signal is transmitted to this part, this is our middle ear, and this drum actually sending out signals to three small pieces of bones inside of ear, the malus, the incus, and the piece. And these drums, actually, these little piece of uh, bones, transmit these sound signals further into the inner part of the ear, which is called cochlea. Cochlea is a fluid-filled, uh, like, small organ, and inside cochlea is, uh, is some cells called the hair cells. So you can see uh, these are just cartoon image of these hair cells. They're uh, actually aligned, like sticking out hairs, uh, look like hairs, and they're sticking out, and these hair cells will sense the movement uh, surrounding them because they're in liquid. Thinking about how your um, sound signal getting amplified inside the liquid, you know, like all sound signals transmit better in liquid or solid than in air. So this is how these sound signal got amplified here. And as the hair cell feeling the movement, they trans transmit these voice signals or sound signals to our brain. That's how we hear. And also there's, a, I listed uh, some of these, uh, I got this information from this five side. You can check them further if you're interested. And there are all kinds of levels of the sound signals from 50 dB is just very quiet sound like air conditioner to a very loud sound uh, such as the jet taking off or the gunshot, which is 140 dBA. We will talk slightly about these signals. And the, you can see these are scanning electron microscope images of our hair cells. And these are normal hair cells. And you can see they're aligned periodically in a very neat order, and those are healthy ones in our ear. 
But if we uh, constantly hear very uh, constantly hear very loud noises, and our hair cell can be damaged permanently. And the below images are some 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 of the hair cells that are damaged that I I found on the internet. So one thing to keep in mind not to listen to constantly listen to very loud noises. And what are considered loud or what are considered quieter noises? And for voice signals or for sound signals we are listening to, uh, those are have uh, the unit called the DBA. It's called A rating signals. Those because our ear uh, actually listen to low frequency first. So we, we couldn't actually, we're not very sensitive to low, fr low frequency audio signals. And DBA means they actually correct this low frequency signals as a relative signal. So if you look at the signal unit, it's 20 times the log of 10 and A2 divided by A1. A2 is our signal that we hear. So it's a relative uh, scale. And looking at this chart at the x-axis is the frequency of the audio signals we are receiving. And the low frequency is like uh, 125 in hertz, or high frequency into 8,000 hertz. Right? You can actually uh, corresponding these uh, images to uh, these objects, and knowing uh, like the, the dripping of your faucet is a very low frequency and also a very low uh, intensity sound signal. But the gunshot here, anything in the dark, uh, um, like pink, purple, pinkish, it's something like we should try to avoid. For example the jet taking off is a high frequency, but also high intensity signal. So the intensity is where uh, it's damaging our uh, like hair cells inside our ear. Okay, so this is uh, one of the typical voice signals that we have, like as you, I'm talking right now, this is part of the signals that I'm transmitting to you. And the below this one is a modulated signal. You can see it's a little bit more complicated, have some of the frequency changes and also some intensity change. And in the, in the previous um, lecture, you heard about how you, uh, why you modulate a signal. And there's a frequency modulation, there's amplitude modulation, right? Why do you need to do that? Because when we are transmitting our signal, we want to modulate them and in a way that we can preserve our signal better and later on we can decode the signals and then we know we are not losing any information. That's all why we need to modulate them. We'll talk a little bit more and do a little bit exercise on that. So here is one of the example. Like now we want to modulate a signal for transmission. And uh, earlier you see you can do linear modulation. You can actually do all kinds of modulation. You can apply a parabolic uh, function to your signal. You can apply for a sinusoidal function. So this is basically your choice. So here I have an electrical device will be turned on by a parabolic input. So this is my input signal, T square. If the carrier signal to be used for transmission is C of T, three times cosine two T, and this is our carrier signal. So we are applying this carrier signal to our input. Basically when you're applying, you're multiplying these two functions together. Graph the modulated signal that will activate the device. So basically what you need to do is you first uh, putting your parabolic signal, so we all know what that parabolic signal looks like. So we have a t, this is function, and then so this is t squared signal, right? And then we also have this uh, transmission signal, it's a, a cosine signal. And then once we apply these signals, so we actually apply a cosine signal with the parabolic signal, so it will look like something like this. So let's see whether we did it correctly. Okay, um, so you have your original input signal, it's the T square, and you apply your carrier signal and three times cosine two T. And then this is how you end it up with and this, uh, this blue signal. And then, um, so when we are transmitting our signal, uh, once we modulate it, we're actually kind of giving another additional character to the signal we're transmitting. Right, then later on actually, we need to receive this signal and then we need to decode. We need to know what was the T square that we put in. But I know what I put in, which is the cosine uh, 2T, this, this function. So I just need to take this cosine 2T function out of this equation, then I can restore my original signal. And once you do that, you need a certain filter to filter out the signals that you don't want. And there are three general type of filters, low pass, high pass, and bandpass filter. 
So low pass, this is very intuitive. So low pass just means the low frequency signal will pass through. And high pass means the high frequency signal will pass through. And band pass, basically, you can pick the frequency you want, and you can reject both the low frequency and the high frequency signals as you want. So this is basically um, a very, very typical shape of a band pass filter, and the x-axis is the frequency. OK, so we can, we can take a look at this one. This is called the demodulation exercise. So for example, we are demodulated our signal. Now we are at the receiver side. We are receiving this signal, and we want to know what our original signal before the modulation looks like. And then here is x is our receiver. And we come in with this function, because uh, it's called m of t, cosine omic t. So it was modulated. And then I put in another signal to help with my uh, demodulation. So I give this receiver additional signal called cosine omega t again. Why am I doing this? You will know later on how I can remove this signal by doing this trick. So once I put in this additional cosine omega t signal, and my original signal become, my received signal become m of t cosine square omega t. So I can do a transform of this equation. We know the cosine square is equal to 1 plus cosine 2 of that angle, and 2 omega t, divided by 2. So once I do this transformation, I have uh, received a signal, which is a half of mt, which is my signal I want to restore, plus a half of mt times cosine 2 omega t. Then I apply a low pass filter to this equation. What it does is, OK, so first I pick the receiver pick up the signal, and then I apply the signal, OK? Then I apply this low pass filter. So which part of this, uh, these two, which part of this equation has a lower frequency? m of t plus m of t times cosine 2 omega t. Which one has a lower frequency? So apparently, the m of t has a lower frequency because cosine omega t, 2 omega t is a fast oscillating cosine function, and it's oscillating at two times of the frequency than what I applied before. So see if you can put in some values of time, and you know this one oscillates twice as much, uh, twice as fast as, uh, than cosine omega t. So as I'm applying my low pass filter, meaning my low frequency is going through. So I take away the cosine 2 omega t part. That's how I ended up with a half of mt. This is my original signal that I want to restore. OK, this is why you need to modulate a signal, and then you need to do the demodulation to restore your original signal. And there's other things. Um, why can the modulated signal pass the filter? Yeah, this is what we did earlier. This is all the math, and then uh, all the details just repeat myself. OK, so that's it about that, um, that exercise. OK, so. How does the filter remove or maintain a certain signals? We said there are three types of filters. There's a low pass filter, there's a high pass filter, and there's a band pass filter. So we can do one exercise and see how these uh, filters are applied to our signals. For example, I have three signals to start with. I have G of 0, and G1, and G2. OK, just by observing these three waveforms, you can immediately figure out the period of these uh, three waveforms. So they are all sinusoidal wave equations. The first one has a period of 2 pi. Basically, the sinusoidal repeat for one time. That's your period, right? Then that's 2 pi is your uh, period. What about the period of the second equation? Anyone want to speak up for the second equation? What is the period of the second equation? Basically, Yes, it's a pi, right? It's how your waveform repeats for one complete cycle. And this one repeats twice, so the twice of the period is 2 pi, so a period is a pi. How about the third one? What is the period of the third one? It's somewhere in between. So an easier way to think about it is 2 pi divided by 3. So when you repeat three times, of your waveform, it reached 2 pi. That means it's a third of that. So 2 pi divided by 3 is the, the period of this function. 
So when you know the period, you can easily know the frequency, which is the inverse of your period. So basically, just one divided by, by t, you know the frequency of these signals. So let's say now I know the frequency of these three signals. Which one has the highest frequency? The one has the smallest period has the highest frequency, right? Because the frequency is one divided by t. So the third one has the highest frequency, and the first one has the lowest frequency. Now let's see. I want to apply a low pass filter, and intuitively you will think the lowest frequency will go through, right? And then because then this is first frequency, second frequency, and the third frequency, and my low pass filter does it as I keep the first frequency uh, to be 1, means I didn't do anything to the first low frequency signal. For the second uh, frequency, I will reduce their amplitude to a half. The third one, because the highest frequency, I will reduce their amplitude to a quarter of that. So once you apply to this low pass filter, your first low frequency signal has, is intact. And your higher frequency signal gets more and more diminished. Okay. The similar concept applied. So now let's do a bandpass filter, I will let go for the middle frequency to be preserved. I'm not changing the middle frequency. That means the second one will contain or maintain the same shape. But the high and the low frequency signals are both going to be diminished or their signal going to be reduced dramatically. The third one is a high pass filter. So again, if you corresponding, the x-axis is frequency. Your low frequency is on the left and high frequency on the right. And you will see the high frequency won't be changed. So your high frequency signal is preserved. But your lowest frequency signal is going to be reduced the most. Right? This is how you can apply the, the light, um, high pass or low pass filter. So you can uh, intentionally reduce or uh, keep a certain signal. OK, so when I'm talking here and you, what you're receiving, and what type of signal is that? Is it an analog signal or a digital signal? So we're talking about uh, analog signal and digital signal all the time. So when I'm talking to you, my voice is yeah, it's an analog so signal. It's when my voice is it's continuous, sometimes I have higher, frequency, uh, higher intensity, sometimes I have lower intensity. So a continuous signal has a different amplitude. Those are uh, like analog signals. But analog signals is very easy to be disturbed. Let's say I can talk to you in a quiet classroom, but I cannot talk to someone in the South Campus and because my signal will get lost easily, get mixed with other sounds, and get carried away with other frequencies, and people won't be able to hear. And also, the amplitude decays really fast. So how can I transmit my analog signal uh, to a further distance. For example, I want to talk to friends um, in Europe, and then I need to convert my analog signal into a digital signal. And this process is called digitalization. digitalization. And then when you want to digitalize your signal, you need to do two things. One is called uh, sampling, and the other one. And then we, we will talk about that. OK, so an analog signal looks like this. So it's continuous, first of all and our amplitude are changing. So I have a continuous amplitude. And I can digi discretize or digitalize it into some called a digital signal. So I have binary signal, for example, is one type of digital signal. Can we just be 0 or 1? So when there is 1, that means I have an amplitude, uh, which is a peak. And the 0 means I have a valley. I can define this way. I can also do uh, modulations to digital signals. And there are two types of modulation. I think you've heard about amplitude modulation. There's also frequency modulation. So for example, I have a signal here, and I can apply another signal is on and off signal. So I modulate the amplitude on and off. And when you receive the signal, you get on signal, off signal, on signal, and off signal. This type of uh, like amplitude modulation are uh, like constantly used in our infrared remote controls and or in fiber communication, transmitter, receiver. And there's also frequency modulation. Like, see, like my modulation didn't do anything to the frequency of the signal. The signal stays the same frequency, means they oscillate the same way. Right? I can also do so-called frequency modulation. What I do is I apply the signal, instead of making it on and off, I can make the frequency change, keep the frequency, change the frequency, keep the frequency, 
change the frequency. In this case, I double the frequency. So I will keep the original signal and modulate the signal for twice the frequency and keep the original signal. And all these modulation of the frequency followed my modulating signal. So this is called a frequency modulation. And the application for these are our modems and our modems actually are using these type of modulation. And again, we know why we're doing sampling and why we are doing uh, digitalization because we want to actually, it's difficult to store or the exact shape of an analog signal. It's difficult to transmit an analog signal. That's why we want to digitalize our analog signal. And there are two steps when we are digitalizing it. And one step is called sampling and the other step called quantization. So what is sampling? Sampling is you have an analog signal, so you have x and y axis, right? Sampling is talking about how you digitalize or discretize your x-axis. So you chop up the continued horizontal axis into discrete intervals. Right now, I'm continuously talking, but if you want to chop the time, and my voice is going to be uh, discretized. So you will hear something, um, then my voice is going to be all disconnected. That's how I am uh, sampling my voices. And this is about the x-axis. So we can also do quantization. Quantization means y-axis. So right now I have all kinds of amplitude. I have a range of voice ranges, but I can just do low or high. So these are called quantization. So you can just do two levels of your voice or six levels of your voice. And that depends on how you quantize your y-axis. So this is to chop up the vertical axis, the continuous vertical axis into discrete levels. And then why do we, how do we do this? And how fine should we sample and quantize? That depends on the signal, right? So if I want to um, make sure all my information was not lost and in the X, in the sampling, I want to make sure my sampling rate is high enough so I'm not losing information in between. And if I don't really care about my voice level, I can just do two types of quantization. I can just do low or high. But if my voice uh, amplitude contain a lot of information, and then I need to quantize it a lot finer. Okay, so let's see this one, and then can do an example. We want to digitize, means we want to sample the x-axis and quantize the y-axis. Um, doing this, this is an analog signal. It's a voltage signal. For simplicity, let's consider representing the signal with just eight samples, meaning I will chop the x-axis into eight pieces. So that's what I did already. And the y-axis or quantization, I will do one bit. So what does one bit mean? It's two to the one. That means I have two signals, which is zero and one, okay? So I will do two, some, uh, two quantization and draw a line in between. So above this one is one, below this one is going to be zero. So after I quantize it, and so I divide the axis into eight intervals, divide the y-axis into two levels and assign zero and one. So above, above this level, so it's all one, below this level is all zero. So after digitalization of two bit, uh, one bit and eight sampling, this is my digital signal looks like, the voltage. Okay, so how about we digitalize the same uh, analog signal into two bit? So what does two bit mean? It's two to the two, so that's four. So my y-axis, instead of having um, two levels, now I'm going to have four levels. Okay, so my, I still keep my sampling rate to be eight intervals, so my x-axis are chopped the same way. Now my y-axis is going to be chopped twice as much. So before I have only zero and one, now I have, have zero, one, two, and three. And then, so we can actually draw lines in between now, like above this line is going to be three, in between is going to be two, in between of this one is going to be one. So my digitalized signal is going to slightly change shape. So as you can see, the analog signal has a lot of information in it, depending on how you sample or how you quantize it, you can get a very different digital signal at, at the end. Okay, so now let's encode what is a bi binary. We said we can do one bit, we can do two bit, we can use binary signals. Uh, this is how our computers are transmitting. So we can do three bits, okay? So numerical three bits, we can do uh, numerical signals zero to seven. 
And in a binary signal, the three bits, what are they going to be like? So you can take about half a minute to think about it, and maybe I can ask someone to answer me. So how about six? What is six? So zero is zero, zero, zero. One will be zero, zero, one. Excellent. So two will be zero, one, zero, right? So that's two because binary means one is two, it's become one to the next digit. And then three will be zero, one, one. Excellent. And four will be one, zero, zero. Five would be one, zero, one. How about six? Yes, right. Very good. So it's one, one, zero. And you all got it. So these are binary signals. I'm sure you have seen it many times, and these are just refreshing your memory. And so we can also do four bits. So now we can have more digits we can restore. And before we can only store seven or eight numbers, right? Now we have four digits we can store 16 numbers, right? So now we can start with zero. Of course, it's zero, 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 zero. How about two? Zero, zero. Exactly, zero, zero, one, zero. Three is zero, zero, one, one. And four is? Two, one, zero, zero. Yes, excellent. Zero, one, zero, zero. And how about seven? Yes, zero, one, one, one. Nine is? Yes, very good. One, zero, zero, one. Ten is? One, zero, one, zero. Excellent. And 12, 11, 12 is here. 13 is one, one. Zero one, exactly. Fourteen is? Excellent. You got all of them. So this is how we have four bits, right? So you can keep adding on. You can do five, six, seven, and you can do 16 bits. So that's why you can have a lot of information contained. In this case, four bits, you can have 16 numbers in here. Okay, there is a riddle here. It's interesting. Last time we tried this, actually one student kind of figured it out. <laughs> so what is round on the outside and high in the middle? Convert the analog signal below to a digital two-bit signal for a clue. Okay, so first of all, uh, it's a two-bit signal. So two-bit signal has how many levels? Two to the two is four, right? We have four levels, okay? So you need to do one, zero, one, two, three. So that's it. So forget about this one. So you have four levels on the y-axis. Okay. And then that they already sample it for you on the x-axis. So you can see, um, maybe you can spend, uh, well, I already know the answer, so it looks very obvious to me. But if you haven't seen the answer, this one may not be that easy. Um, if you convert it, I can give you a hint. It's all letters. It's letters. Those are all letters. Then they convert it into a word. So what is this signal here? It will be zero, right? And this signal will be three. And this signal will be zero. Oh, sorry. This is two. So zero, one, two. So zero, two, two, zero. And you need to kind of draw it to be able to figure out. And then three, and then I guess it's two, and zero, and um, three, and zero, and a three, three, zero. Did everybody get this? You have to draw it to be able to see. You got it. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited. Yes, it's Ohio. It's round on the outside and high in the middle. It's Ohio. Exactly. Are you from Ohio? No. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of close to us. Yeah, very good. So this is just some fun things you can convert. Uh, analog signals into digital signals. You can transmit some scripts to your friends and no one can actually decode. And you can tell them uh, you can digitalize this way and sampling that way. And that's how you'll figure out my secret message next time. Okay, decoding. Uh, the round means O are round. Yeah, hi, H I. <laughs> hi. Oh, and high in the middle. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so the next example is 
decoding a frequency modulated signal. Th this is not a uh, riddle anymore, so we just uh, have some <laughs> more plain math here. So we have original signal here. So we have a low frequency signal connected with high frequency signal, and then connect to another low frequency signal, high frequency, and a low frequency signal. So I will assign my low frequency signal to be zero, because I, I want to decode it, and my high frequency signal to one. So I have zero, one, and then can you fill the middle? So I have zero, one, so one. one, zero, zero. Yes, very good. So we assign all these numbers, and the decoded signal is 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, right? So you can use frequency as a way to code your signal. OK, very good. So now I want you to send a code with the frequency. OK, 0 is a low frequency, and 1 is a high frequency. OK, so what does the first one look like? We'll show you first. So I have a low signal, low signal, low signal. Hi, hi, hi. Okay, I want one brief person to come in to draw the second one. So the, let me see. I have, this one's working. So who wants to come in and draw my second signal? We need a brave person. Come on, you're all teachers. You ask students to come to draw all the time. Now it's your turn. Yeah. Yes, you're, yeah, you're called. Should you uh, receive this mission? <laughs> Accept it or not? Oh, excellent. OK, so high is a high frequency signal. So what you draw is some of these waveforms like this. I can help you to start with. OK, so oh, I know you can do it. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm looking at it. So right. this is, is this? Soon to be, um, did you break this up like a zero, zero, one, zero, or negative one, zero, one, something yeah, like that? Yeah, so, so you I just copy this. This is one, right? So you're going to draw a waveform as two times the frequency. So it's one, as zero will be low frequency. Oh, you want a high. Okay, hold yeah. on. I got to get my pictures together. Right. This so is this, low. This is one. Low, this is zero, zero, low, zero, low, one, one, one. High, that's a high. High, high, high. High, 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 high. Right. So oh this is one. It's so going this, to be high. This, oh gosh, this Sorry. is a high. It starts here. Yes. Okay. okay go. go. Somewhere there's a line in here. You don't worry. Don't worry about the line. Okay. So okay. Just do the waveform. So uh, two types of frequency. This is only one. Okay. This is still low. Still low. You have to go low. up again. Wait a minute. This is still one because it's a low high. I'm one looking at to twice for a one. Okay, twice. Twice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Again, up. You have to go up. So you have to have this waveform. Oh, so so this is a one. OK. So this is, this one. is a one. Because it's okay. here to here. Right. Then and I then you will do a zero. A low. OK. Low will be stretch the so signal. Here to here. That's a low. Be longer. longer. You yeah. want it longer? So wider. it's going to be no, wider. Oh, wider. Not longer, but wider. That's, that's right. You like that? Is that a good deal? Something like that, yeah. So you just repeat the waveform of that one. Right, excellent. Okay, so you can do you can, can do I one again, do the same one, one for the here. first one. And this okay, is one, one, okay. Two, one. Okay. So you want them to be more I, narrow. I, I, I yeah. Know. So the frequency. So thinking about from the frequency. You need some grids here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not yeah. Sure With grid. frequency. Oh yeah. With grids, it will be a lot easier. So this is this one. I'm starting at this tip. So this is. Here. Good. So here. you have a waveform has a twice the frequency. Here. Okay, off. And here. That's Excellent. A, so that's a high frequency. This is high. And you need a low frequency again because my oh gosh. fourth one so is zero. Right here. Low frequency. It it's more wide. stretched. Yes. Is that stretched good? That's pretty good. And then okay, so we have no room. I have so no room. Yeah, basically <laughs> she did she did correctly. We did one zero one zero. So high frequency, low frequency, high frequency, low frequency. And Very good. Yeah. So low. yeah, you need another the repeat. Right. So it's the same, but okay. you don't have room. So who can draw the third one? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your yes, yes. courage. Speaking. Since he volunteered yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Popcorn. Welcome. Okay. So let's do low frequency, low, low. Zero, zero, 
and a one it's a high frequency very good and then zero zero one a question that I was going to ask maybe well, maybe yes. you could entertain this question too. <laughs> Fair really down. Very good. Are we, are we assuming that I like confirm you did it correctly. When we send codes and wavelengths, are they mimicking either the sine or cosine function? Is that the message behind this? So it's, I think it's more like the frequency, in terms of this, it's more frequency, right. so uh, you don't differentiate where the zero start with right. is like a uh, cosine or sine. Like shape wise. Yeah, it's more frequency wise, right? So like high frequency is this omega one, mm -hmm. low frequency is omega zero. So when you uh, receive the signal, you know the first signal was a high frequency signal, it will decode into one, and the second is a low frequency signal, it will decode into zero. Because when I'm thinking of like the sine and cosine, when I think of sine, I'm always thinking about. You start from zero, yes, and, and cosine you, know, you start with one. With cosine, I'm thinking about it's a little bit more stretched out a little bit. Yeah, it's, that's just, you have basically sine and cosine just switch the, like shifting the x See, axis, okay. right? So they, and they both have the same basic shape. They have the same yeah, shape, which that's right. Which mimics a radio, which mimics, say, a radio wave. Exactly. A radio wave is going to look like, a, you could say, oh, it looks like a sine. Yes. by modulating the frequency, you get FM, frequency modulation, FM. Okay. Yeah. And that was my FM, question. FM I wrote FM radio about waves are waves. sent by modulating frequency. Okay. AM radio waves are sent by modulating frequency. Amplitude. Modulation. Okay. Yeah. So they have a constant frequency. Right, right, right. Because we changing were talking about Okay. Right. So we are, mod right now we are actually decoding the frequency in this case. So he did it correctly and there are two waveforms behind the board and I confirm it's right. Oh, I think that's it for all we have for now and I think later uh, Linfo will have a demo. Oh, okay. Yeah. So next we're gonna switch over to the lab view again. Um, so I'll take the mic again. Oh, yes. Thank you. Sure. Oops. Oops. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so um, the first one that we're going to do, if I remember the order correctly, um, is fixed frequency player. And you'll, yeah, so you'll open up in LabVIEW and you'll use your headsets. Um, so be prepared. Um, I would say don't plug the headsets into your ears just yet. Um, plug it in. Make sure the volume is good before you plug it uh, into your ears. Um, and we're going to run the fixed frequency player. Oh, and since I don't need a headset. <laughs> Although I could demonstrate kind of stuff and the video can record it. Okay. So, yeah, so what you have under your control is the signal amplitude, so how loud it is, um, the signal frequency. Um, so first, uh, just go ahead and play a single note. Um, pleasant notes are like 440 hertz, so that's A. Um, there are some other notes that are less pleasant, like um, 15,000 hertz or 14,000 hertz. It's a nice um, ear-piercing sound. So I may as well demo that. All right. Yep, so you can try out just single frequencies. Um, the top graph shows the signal in the time domain, and the bottom graph shows it in the frequency domain. Um, so as you can see, it's a single frequency signal, so there is a peak at the frequency that the sine wave is being driven. Some of the other things that you can do, um, you can add noise to the signal. So I'm going to turn my volume down so that you don't hear mine as much. And you can either use the slider or you can type numbers in. And then you can add noise. So there are two different types of noise that you can add. Um, one is called white noise, which basically means that it has, turn this down quite a bit. Um, it basically means it has signal at all frequencies, so it's random. 
And so you hear that hiss sound that you're like on a plane or um, you're, uh, yeah. So that's white noise. It's, oh, sleep to that. Yeah, studies show that white noise allows people to sleep, um, especially babies. Um, so yeah, so this has a frequency representation such that there is noise at all different frequencies. And as you increase the amplitude, that just raises the level of the noise. There's also something called pink noise. Um, pink noise is found typically in electronic circuits. Um, there are some random processes that lead to a noise that has an uh, increase in noise as you reduce the frequency. So as you go to lower and lower frequencies, there's more and more noise. And as you go to higher frequency, the noise goes away. So uh, you can play around with the two sources of noise. Um, if you have noise, some of the things that you can do to get rid of the noise is you can filter. So next to the noise, there are different filters you can pick. Um, the first one is called smoothing, which we didn't really talk about in much detail, but what that does is it averages. So if you look at the time domain for the uh, no filter case, um, you'll notice that there's these ripples on top of the signal, and that is the noise. But if you put smoothing, what that does is it averages nearby data points along the time axis. So you get rid of a lot of that um, noise. So you still have quite a bit of noise, but it's not as bad. Um, I'm going to turn the noise off now. It has a delay, unfortunately. Um, and so we can go back and we can listen to our single frequency signal. Um, we can play around with different filters. So one filter that we talked about is high pass. So it allowed the high frequencies to pass through. So you'll notice that the low frequency part here, this got attenuated compared to if there's no filter. So with no filter, it's a very small change, but this part is higher. And then if you do high pass, it allows the high frequencies to go through and the low frequencies got attenuated. If you do low pass, it does the opposite. The low frequencies go through and then the high frequencies will get attenuated. So this is low pass compared to no filter. It's a very small change. Um, it's probably more noticeable if I have white noise on, so let me turn back the white noise on. So okay, so this is the baseline. This is, there's noise at all these different frequencies. So if I do high pass, it's going to filter out the noise at low frequency. If I do low pass, it filters out the noise at high frequency. And if I do band pass, it filters out the noise on both the low and the high side. And we get something that looks a lot more like a single frequency sine wave. All right. So that's the first demo. Um, so go ahead and press stop once you're done playing around with that. Um, the second demo is called uh, multi-frequency player. Um, so I was inspired because we have a musician in the audience, and so I decided to create something um, that has the different tones that you'd find in a piano. I wanted to test out how well this would represent and how good of a quality this would play. Um, so currently what I've set up is, so these are the frequencies for the different notes for a single octave. Um, so 263.6 hertz up to 523 uh, hertz. And what I've turned on is a chord for C, E, and G. Is that a good chord or is that a bad chord? No, it's definitely a good chord, but my question is, which C is it? Um, middle I believe 256 is middle C. Middle C. So you're using middle C chord. Yeah, so middle C and higher. C4. C4, okay, so cool. So we have um, uh, this particular chord, and so you'll notice that it has um, an interesting uh, time domain signal. Um, you can also see the frequency domain signal. So the frequency domain signal, um, there are three peaks. Now, the reason that the three peaks are not exactly the same is has to do with the frequency that these um, signals are compared to the sampling frequency. So the audio has a uh, sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz, and it turns out that 440, which is, um, uh, what is that, 440 is A, um, and also G, which is 392, they're very close to integer multiples of the sampling rate. So as a result, in the frequency domain, it looks like it's a single frequency. These other signals, which are at 
frequencies that are not multiples of the sampling, they're very far apart from it, and because we're only measuring a small amount of time, like we're not measuring an infinitely long signal, um, we get something called spectral leakage. So this is like a very advanced topic, but basically the signal that is supposed to be a single frequency, there's a tiny bit of representation of other frequencies that aren't actually there, and that has to do with the fact that we have a finite duration for our signal. If we played it for longer, these things would get narrower. Okay, so you can play around with uh, the different uh, chords um, or uh, uh, notes um, and find something that, that sounds good. Unfortunately or fortunately, um, there's a four second delay between when you make an adjustment and when the frequency changes. Um, and that's partly because I wanted to be able to show um, a long enough signal that these things sound correctly. Um, if we play it too short, it chops up the signal and it doesn't sound good. So, and then there's also the volume adjustment that's here. It seems like it's not. Oh, like but there's the delay. Say it again. Oh, to simulate what the record sounds like. <laughs> that you get that scratching. So. Uh, <laughs> adding noise. Yeah, that would be something that's interesting to look at is um, if, you rec if you play something on the record player and you capture its time domain and frequency domain signal, how much different is that versus the CD? And as you mentioned, if you add noise, then you can replicate the, the record player. So I'd be curious to know, like, is it low frequency noise? Is it high frequency noise that tends to get added? All right, and similar to the other one, you can do filters. Um, this time, I explicitly put the low frequency and high frequency cutoffs. So you can, for example, if I'm playing 392 and I decide to do a uh, low pass filter, I'm going to cut off below 200 uh, hertz. And because I'm at uh, 392, that's actually not going to do anything. Like, I'm not actually filtering it because the cutoff for the low frequency is already so small. If I were to increase this so I make a cutoff uh, occur at, let's say, 600 hertz, now 200, or sorry, 392 hertz, which is the signal that I'm playing, that's now below the cutoff. Oh, sorry, I'm doing low pass. If I did high pass um, and I change the cutoff frequency, okay, so when you do high pass, what matters is the low frequency cutoff. So it's going to cut off signals that are below 600 hertz. So that's why the sound went away when I set this uh, to 600 hertz. But if this is at 300 hertz, I'll still be able to hear it because now I'm cutting off at a frequency that's um, below the frequency I'm playing. So you can play around with that as well. OK, so now the next one that we want to explore um, is what does an amplitude modulated signal sound like? So we're going to be. Um, building an FM radio, but um, it's also instructed to see what does the AM wave look like. Um, so I've preset the defaults so that it's playing um, at a data frequency or at a carrier frequency of 400 hertz. So that's the overall uh, carrier wave, so 400 cycles per second. This is what it looks like in the time domain. Oh, um, so uh, close your uh, one and open AM amplitude modulation sound output. Okay, so the carrier wave is at uh, 400 hertz, and then on top of the 400 hertz signal, I'm adding a 40 hertz data frequency signal. So when I combine these two, what I end up with is I get this modulated signal. The envelope of this modulation, so it goes up, down, up, down, this is at 40 hertz, so the low frequency. And on top of that, I'm modulating internally at uh, 400 hertz. If you do a trig formula expansion, so if you expand um, the product, so if you have sine of 400 hertz T times sine of 40 hertz T, what you get is the sum in the different frequencies. So if I multiply these two sine waves together, I can write it as the, so I'm doing product to sum formula, I can write it as the sum of two uh, different frequencies. So you'll notice that there are two signals in this frequency domain representation of the FM wave. One is at 440 and the other is at 360. 
So I've taken my carrier wave at 400, I've modulated its amplitude at 40, and I generate the sum frequency 440 and the difference frequency 360 hertz. And so I hear two tones now. It's, it's a telephone. telephone. <laughs> <laughs> so you can play around you can play around with this a little bit. I know. The yeah. young was like, oh yeah, that's definitely telling me. I still have a later mind. Oh, really? Yeah, long hair down. Yeah, but the digital ones don't do it. It had to be the ones that were the ones that have the wires. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why you think it's a digital. Yeah, we just pulled it out. Okay, so you can play around both with the carrier frequency and also with the data frequency. And basically, you're always going to be generating two tones when you do this amplitude modulation. Now, if I were to pick the data frequency equal to the carrier frequency, I'll generate the sum, which is at 800 hertz, and I'll generate the difference, which is at DC. And DC is something that you can't hear. So you can only hear from about 20 hertz to um, teenagers can hear maybe 18,000 hertz. As you get older, the frequency, the upper limit of what you can hear uh, gets reduced. And so I would say adults probably 13,000 hertz or so. So one of the ways that uh, teenagers uh, used to be able to communicate with each other, like without their parents knowing, is that they set their cell phones to ring at a frequency that's beyond what the parents can hear. So they can hear their phones ring, but their parents don't know that their phone is ringing. So <laughs> advantages of being young. <laughs> OK, so that's the amplitude modulation module. So now go ahead and close and open the frequency modulation module. So this one is a little bit more complicated. Um, Oh yeah, you can, so you can test that, so we'll do it at the very end. You can, we'll test out, we'll play the sounds and we'll say, okay, can you still hear it? Can you still hear it? And then we'll figure out when you can't hear it anymore. Um, I guess we can do that now. So let's do the fixed frequency player. So I'll play it on the speakers. Um, okay, so that's 400. This is 4,000, 10,000. 12,000, 14,000. Can people still hear it? Anyone not be able to hear it? I could not hear it. You cannot hear it. No, I okay. I can still hear it. Um, <laughs> Tell me how old we are. <laughs> can people still hear that? <laughs> I can still hear it. I could not hear it. Okay, so three of us can still hear. Um, let's go up and to. You can still hear it, of course. Okay, so this one, so I'll turn up the volume and dogs around the neighborhood are going to start barking. Um, I can't hear this anymore. I can't hear it. You can hear it? You can hear it? You can hear it? All right, so the three youngest uh, <laughs> participants can still hear it. So, yeah, so the hearing cuts off somewhere around 15,000, uh, 12,000 to 15,000, depending on your age. And I think that's actually, I think that's actually kind of feel it as being. Yeah, because there's a pressure. Because it's, mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. Your ears feel. My, feet, my ears feel something. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's interesting. All right, so let's now jump into the FM, um, the frequency modulation. Um, so the default sounds okay. Um, you can set these to sound really, really bad. Um, so what I've done is I've set the baseband frequency to 200 hertz. So the baseband is the frequency that I'm going to um, uh, add or use to change the frequency of the carrier wave. Um, the carrier frequency I've set to be 400 hertz, and there's something called uh, FM deviation, and that, um, I wish I remember this off the top of my head, I don't, it's in the textbook. Um, so that also controls um, the way that the frequency is modulated. So what it looks like in the time domain is something like this. So you'll see that there's a certain frequency. It says the FM deviation will widen the spike. 
will widen the spike. Okay, yes. so when we mix these two signals, um, we're generating these, harm these um, uh, sums and differences of the frequencies, and the FM deviation controls how wide this is. Um, so if I increase the FM deviation, these should get wider, although it's very hard to see. You can hear it though. So it's distorting a little bit of the, um, the shape. OK, so you can adjust the baseband frequency. You can adjust the carrier frequency. And you can see what it happens. Um, so we start generating these additional um, notes. And the reason that the original one didn't have those is because everything was integer multiples of each other. Um, now that I've set these to be um, not integer multiples, we start uh, mixing and getting multiple tones in that. So I'm going to reset this to default. Uh, go back to the default um, and set this to Yeah, so as you change the um, carrier frequency and the baseband frequency, um, you generate different frequency content uh, in your time domain signal. So you have a time domain signal, and it looks a certain way. And to represent that time domain signal in the frequency domain, uh, you have a different spectrum. So what you'll be uh, building for the FM transmitter, the carrier uh, frequency will be in the megahertz, so hundreds of megahertz, um, because it's going to be a radio wave. And then um, I'm not sure what the other values will be for your baseband and your frequency deviation for the circuit you build.